Hey there, welcome back to the podcast. It's time for part four of the ongoing series, Confronting Christmas, the Spiritual Man Perspective. And again, thanks for listening. If you're still making it along the journey here, I'm very thankful. I would say that that says a lot about your willingness to at least, like the title says, to confront what we believe and what we do, why we do what we do. Um, Before I lose my train of thought, I just finished up um, part three, and I want to continue that um, that thought process as we just looked at the things that Gamaliel said. Now, I know, obviously, he's not talking about Christmas. I mean, let's just be clear. But what he was talking about is anything that's of human origin will fail. Anything that is purposed and endeavored out of the pattern of the world and humanity's own attempt to carry out anything deemed even spiritual or godly, it will not remain. It will not remain. And may I remind you, Christmas is not remaining. It's not remaining, friend. Listen, according to the spiritual perspective, according to what people say that it's really about. Because again, to be clear, this so-called war on Christmas says what? Evangelical America makes it clear that Christ has been removed from Christmas and all it's doing is becoming commercial. All it's doing is becoming pagan. (laughs) And I'm saying, could it be possible that it's simply going back to its original source? It's returning back to where it started, and that is the, that is the evidence, that is the fruit, that it is, in fact, of human origin. Because if it is from God, it could not be stopped. And friends, it's being stopped. It is nothing more than the celebrations of men. I'm convinced of that being true. And so, moving from that idea, I was thinking about how we say, in, in all of us, this is the potential, right? And at some point, we've all done it. Well, I would never oppose God. There's no way anything that I willfully do opposes Him. I'm clear. Okay, but... I understand that. Like, even presently, like the present convictions of my life post immersion remain like I have this, I have this conscience that's clear that was sprinkled. I appealed to God through that, through that, those baptismal waters. Like, I'm, I'm staying in that, in that immersed, cleansed, purified place. But listen, we have to all be careful. To continually also acknowledge that, you know what? There is error in me. There is error in me. There are things in me that in this present moment I do not see rightly. That I do not execute perfectly unto God in a way that's perfectly pleasing to Him. And so I was thinking at the end of the last part, in part three, I was thinking right before I turned it off and I started to go there. And for time's sake, I pushed it over here to part four is about Saul. When Saul met the Messiah, on the road he was encountered by Yeshua himself in the bright light, and he fell to his knees. That man, Saul, was the most zealous law keeper of law keepers. Why? To be found keeping the ways of God, the ordinances of God. He was rock solid sure what he was doing was advancing the ways and laws of God. But what happened was when he met the Messiah, everything changed. He was blinded, so his natural perception was turned off. And he saw something different when the illumination of the Christ encountered him. And it was revealed to him that Saul, in fact, you are a persecutor of me. You're not just persecuting my followers, you're persecuting me. Now we know Saul who became Paul, his response was, Lord, I didn't know. And he abandoned everything he knew. He forsook everything he knew and called it garbage. Why? Because he encountered the Messiah. And everything that he thought was right now, that he thought was good, that he thought was sourced, and actually in his case was sourced in God, but God had changed how men approach him 
via coming as the Son, the Emmanuel reality now. And he had to recognize, you know what? Unknowingly, I've been in opposition. I've been in opposition of the ways of Yahweh God. But he, he admitted that. He humbled himself. He was literally transformed. <laughs> he was literally regenerated into a new man. And walked out that life abandoning what he knew. And to the best of his ability, according to the Spirit of God, undoing everything he had created. By, by explaining to men the good news of repentance, of faith. And so we're not above that, friends. We're not above clinging tightly to something absolutely confident and sure. There's no way this is an opposition of God. We always hold the potential to cling to something that we have not yet rightly understood. So keep that in mind. So this year, I've already heard people, again, it's only December the 6th, the first Christmas, Jesus' birth. I've heard, I've heard preachers that I love talk about, well, back in Bethlehem um, on December 25th at the very first Christmas, God became man. I'm like, y'all, <laughs> nobody back then said, okay, from now on, this is Christmas time. It didn't go like that. It, it, the angel didn't declare from today on you will call this Christmas and like get trees and hang holly. And, and in, nobody did that. Nobody instated a spiritual commemoration of the birth of Jesus. And in nowhere are we instructed to do so. Let's just keep it very simple. Many early followers of the way, the Nazarene people, the followers of the name, they rejected it. They, they denounced it entirely. They did not give themselves to the celebratory nature of what became the Christian church, branded Christian, in order to be controlled by the worldly government. They didn't do it. They didn't even adopt the calendar. We don't have time to get into all that. That has to do with the feast as well. And admittedly, admittedly, I've been ignorant of that too. I've been guilty myself. But can I say something bluntly? Now listen to what I'm going to say. We find no scriptural warrant whatsoever for observing any day as the birthday of the Savior. And consequently, its observance is a superstition because it's not of divine authority. The observance of Christmas is a superstition because it is not of divine authority. Chew on that for a second and then let me, and just kind of let that stew in you a minute and how you feel about that phrase. It's very blunt. But what if I told you that I'm not the one that said that? What if I told you that that's not my quote? What if that was actually penned by an author teacher you may know and v actually very highly revere? Not by me. Charles Spurgeon said that. He had many opinions about Christmas. That was his statement, not mine. Most all of his thoughts on Christmas, perhaps surprisingly to most people, would offend you greatly. He abhorred the Christmas tradition. He went on to say, we have no superstitious regard for times and seasons. Certainly, we do not believe in the present ecclesiastical arrangement called Christmas. How absurd to think we could do it in the spirit of the world. With a Jack Frost clown, a deceptive worldly Santa Claus, and a mixed program of sacred truth with fun, deception, and fiction. If it be possible to honor Christ in the giving of gifts, I cannot see how, while the gift, the giver, and the recipient are all in the spirit of the world. With more still, he went on to say this, Upright men strove to stem the tide, but in spite of all their efforts, the apostasy went on, until the church, with the exception of a small, of a small remnant, was submerged under pagan superstition. That Christmas is a pagan festival, it is beyond all doubt. The time of the year, the ceremonies with which it is celebrated, proves its origin. Those who follow the custom of observing Christmas follow not the Bible, but pagan ceremonies. 
Charles Spurgeon, 1871. Now, I say that because you could easily just disregard me as some ogre of a man who just wants to spoil your fun. But what if someone like him? What if someone who's respectable, revered, popular, seen as godly? Many people read his writings before they start every day of their life. Again, this is not my idea. This is not my idea. Maybe my, my thoughts don't hold any weight with, with you, and understandably so. But what about his? What about what he said? So we have the inception of the church. Possibly rejecting one of the most beloved men of God in recent history who said Christmas is simply not a biblical God-endorsed celebration. So I'm not going to present a list of all the texts about how God opposes man's festivals. It's throughout the whole Old Testament. It is a very, very strict pattern, clearly seen. God hates the patterns and celebrations of man. It is an Old Testament theme if there is one. Read, read Exodus, just Exodus alone. And like, God hates the mixing of his people with those who are not of his nation. And how humanity adds to the God-ordained festivals. That's an Exodus all over the place. The instated festivals of God. So the issue at hand really is what do we want? Do we want good memories The emotions that come with it, enjoyable times together, the lights, the trees, the gifts, the breakfasts under, you know, beside the table or beside the Christmas tree with the gifts under it. Do we want all of those warm, fuzzy things? Or are we willing to seek the Lord's face for what is right and acceptable in His sight according to His word? Are we willing? That's all I'm asking. Again, that's all I'm doing is asking the question. Are you sure in your heart that you're willing to forego your traditions and celebrations in order to present yourself as holy, pleasing, and acceptable to the Lord? Are you absolutely sure of that, or have you even put that out on the table of sacrifice before the Lord? Have you ever asked yourself specifically, God, is it pleasing to you for us to celebrate the Christmas tradition? Does this please you? And then you just sit back and you wait for days and weeks and months to get clarity on that and confidently know that the Lord God himself has spoken to you through his word, through prayer, through the confirmation of the Holy Spirit in you about what you do and don't do. Now let's update right to today for me. Even recently in messianic influence circles, I see the celebration of Christmas present, which in all honesty really surprised me. Really caught me off guard when I started finding people who do in fact celebrate the festivals, keep the Sabbath. Uh, Not necessarily Torah observant, but kind of more so than I am but yet still have christmas <laughs> and so i and in and just in a in a innocent surprise i've just really been like wow that's we've been influenced strongly influenced we've all been drawn into this appealing celebration that just has no command to be celebrated it baffles me it really does how it's infiltrated pretty much every facet of the body of Christ. Now, few seem to argue the point that the Bible in no way whatsoever commands us to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Most people would say, I know. Now, there would be some people who say, well, surely it's in there somewhere. But I mean, like, mature, biblically, you know, fluent people, most of them would say, well, no, I know it's, we're not commanded to do that. But nobody really goes beyond that. Asking, why do we then, with such vigor, 
right alongside all of those in the world who say Christianity is, is, is a joke. There's no Emmanuel. There's no Messiah. There's no one true Yahweh God. But there's Christmas. Most seem would flippantly say, it's all about Jesus, so it must be okay. I would say this is just very dangerous territory. Jesus does not need a birthday party, my friend, as if he's mere man. He does not need a birthday party. So why even bring this up then? You, you, can, you can ask this question, and it's very applicable. Well, Joel, what's your point? Why bother? If you're convinced nobody cares, it's, it's the pattern of the world, it's, it's infiltrated the church, we're all deceived, myself included, I just want to provoke you to ask some questions. Are you willing to dare to believe that the celebration of Christmas may at least hold the potential to not be as we've been told? To not even be pleasing to the Lord like we would like to say it is. What if in our abandoning of the feasts and festivals of the Lord and or the addition of pagan celebrations, we in fact have forsaken something sacred and beautiful that was designed and instated by God himself? What if we have unknowingly in our ignorance and in our just, we're just carrying on the traditions of our fathers now. Men who hate religion. I mean men who think the spirit of religion is in the cereal, cereal box on the table for breakfast. Love Christmas and the spirit of Christmas. It baffles me. Literally, I will say to my wife, I cannot believe that so-and-so, a brother in the Lord, I'm just being honest, follows so hardly, <coughs> excuse me, after the Christmas tradition, traditions. It blows my mind. It has infiltrated us all. The biblical theme of mixing should be at the forefront of our concern in everything that we align ourselves with. We're to be alien. We're to be set apart. We are to be distinct. We must give ourselves to this if we're to be deemed worthy to bear the name of Yahweh as our banner. If we celebrate any holiday or festival of men alongside the world free from this distinction, we're mixed, we're earthy, we're natural. Y'all, that's, that's a biblical principle and I hardly know any of it. I am no Bible scholar. I know that clear as a bell just from the little bit of studying I've done over the years of the patterns of the scriptures. God hates mixing. The Garden of Eden, mixing. The Tower of Babel, mixing. The Days of Noah, mixing. The Nephilim, mixing. Y'all, listen. God hates the mixing of his people with the world. He set us apart to be distinct and different for a reason, for our own good, for his glory. So would you just ask the question? Would you spend the next days, weeks, and months asking God himself if he's pleased with the celebration of the Christmas holiday? Have you done that before? I already asked that question. Have you done that and just freedom to, to like hear an answer that maybe you don't prefer? That's all I'm asking. We will not have conviction on a matter until we're presenting it to the Lord to seek his approval in the first place. Do you hear what I'm saying? So many people could easily say with this in, in a justified place, right, of defense, hey, I don't have that conviction. That's completely fine for you, Joel. That's completely fine for you in your household. I don't have that conviction, so I don't have to do anything with it. Now, I understand that, but listen to what I'm saying. How would you? How would you? Have you presented it to the Lord ever? Have you ever laid it on the altar of sacrifice for even one season in your whole life? To see what the Lord would say about it. Have you said, listen, you gathered your family around? 
You called your parents, your grandparents, your children if they're grown, and said, y'all, listen. I don't have a conviction about Christmas, but like I heard this crazy guy in the Virginia mountains talk about what if Christmas is pagan. And you know, you know what, guys? I don't think it is. I think it's right and good. I think it's godly. I love it. I love y'all. I love my grandchildren. I love, if you're younger, I love going to my grandparents' house. I love everything about it. But y'all, we're not going to do it this year. And then you hold the phone out from the, the, the air being sucked out of the atmosphere in, in disbelief. <laughs> but then you just say, I want the will of the Lord so bad, big deal. Friends, I'm telling you, I just wish I could repeat this phrase for two hours, and that's just the whole podcast recording. Whatever feeling you have when I say, friend, what if you didn't do Christmas this year? Whatever feeling you have in your gut shows shows what place it has in your heart. If you think about, well, what about gifts for my grandbabies? Well, what about the Christmas party at work? Well, what about not having a Christmas tree? Well, what about not having an Advent calendar? Well, what about not traveling to my parents' house and sitting around a decorated table with holly leaves and berries and lit candles? Well, what about my Christmas dress? Well, what you know what I'm saying? We value these things so much more than we even realize because we do not sit down and ask ourselves, is this on the sacrificial table of my life unto the Lord? Could you do that? Could you do that? Could you say, a tree in my living room means nothing compared to having clarity of conscience before Yahweh God? What if the exchange illuminates something that you have not yet even considered? The church has lost her way. She's lost her distinction. (sighs) What if these celebrations are actually hindering us from being a distinguished set-apart people? Again, I'm about to bring this to a close. The entire nation celebrates Christmas. Do you understand that? Your gay friends, your your homosexual neighbors, people who worship other gods openly celebrate Christmas. People who are atheistic do not believe there is a God. There is no Elohim of Elohims. There is no Messiah, the Son, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus has no place. Celebrate Christmas alongside you, friend. The entire nation, the ungodly, openly celebrate Christmas. Void of honoring the Lordship of the Messiah. If it were about Him now, it would have to be abandoned by the world. And it could not continue on without Jesus, period. If the holiday was truly about Yeshua Messiah coming to earth as the God-man, this festival, this celebration would have to be abandoned by the world that does not believe in Him. It could not continue on as it does. Period. But it has. And it will continue to entirely unfazed, friend. I don't care how many churches picket it. I don't care how many church signs you put up there and demand you keep Christ in Christmas, friend. It will continue without Jesus as any part. I'm just beginning to explore the proper celebrations of the Lord's Feast in my house. I know nothing. I know next to nothing about it, but I feel such a conviction as I have unplugged from the celebrations of the world. We do not go by a a Roman calendar. We don't do Mother's Day. We don't do Father's Day. We don't do Grandparents' Day. 
We don't do Christmas. I'm telling you, the list goes on and on. Well, why? I will not live my life according to a calendar that I bought at Walmart that someone thousands of years ago wrote on a calendar and told me I must do. Or in the case of modern national holidays, of what in recent years, I mean brand new recent years, put on a calendar and said, hey, on this day, you do this because that's what you do here. You and everybody else in this nation, we're all doing the same thing. Well, why? Don't you ask questions. You do it. Seriously, y'all, I'm not a rebellious, ridiculous young man with angst. I'm just saying I want to cling to the ordinances of God. And so I'm trying to to ask the Lord and to give myself, my wife and I, to reclaiming the Lord's feasts, the Lord's celebrations. Because I think by abandoning them, We've left the door open to instate our own celebratory events that now bring glory and attention, a glory and attention to the Creator, to the creation, instead of the Creator. Look, look, y'all, I've talked about this in a podcast months and months ago. I'm serious. This just <laughs> this gets me. Today is Love Your Pet Day. Today is. National Hot Dog Day. Today's Grandparents Day. Today's Mother's Day. Today's Independence Day. Today's President's Day. Today is, you know what I'm saying? We were created to be a celebratory people, but not according to these ways. Not according to these natural traditions of men that are all about us to make us have fun and feel better about our life. We were to celebrate the feasts and the festivals of the Lord, and I do not claim in any way to know exactly what that means. I'm ignorant. I'm lacking. I am guilty myself of not keeping the festivals of the Lord. We remember our own family memories and traditions, but we do not remember the works of Yahweh. We don't. We remember the warm, fuzzy things of this natural blade of grass life, but we do not remember the statutes and ordinances of Yahweh God. If Christmas was deemed pagan and found void of being a truly God-pleasing celebration, would you still carry on the tradition? I'm really asking that. Again, If you gave yourself to truly place it before the Lord to see what God says and be willing in your heart to give it up, would you do it? Could you give it up? Because, friends, it's going to cost you. You are going to look like a fool. I stand in line at Kroger, and people say, Hey, buddy, you ready for Christmas? Is Santa Claus coming because you've been good? And I'm telling you all, it is awkward. And it is excruciating to time after time after time say, we don't celebrate Christmas. I'm sorry. Hey, buddy, you dressing up for Halloween? We don't celebrate Halloween. I'm sorry. You don't want some candy for your son? What's wrong with you? Seriously now. You don't like giving your son gifts? Man, I'd hate to be him. I'm telling you, there is a great cost. I don't want to be a mixed race people. I don't want to be a mixed race people because in the pattern of scripture, God has rejected such men. (sighs) Why? It opposed everything God instated for the sake of the folklore practices of men. Christmas, as I already briefly touched on, originated with the church trying to reach the world. And from my opinion, more so join themselves with the world's celebration because they wanted to celebrate it too. Let's just be honest. They wanted to do something fun. And it's digressed to be void of Jesus entirely. It's returned to its origin. The fruit of it has deemed it to be failing. It's not sourced in Yahweh God's commands or ordinances that we're to observe. 
We must be willing to admit that this is the case in order to move forward free from the patterns of the world that have infiltrated the dilapidated borders of the distinct people of God. And I'll end this where I started it. In humility, but free from timidity now, I desire to extend the Hezekiah call for the people of God to, the re- to return to the statutes and ordinances of Yahweh God. He alone has a prescribed way. And until we've done away with our own ways, our own traditions, our own celebrations, we will never find and follow His. So friends, in absolute conclusion, will you please take this before the Lord? Take it before Him and ask Him in that quiet place for hours, for days, for weeks, for months, for however long it takes to establish a willingness in your heart to say, God, I'm willing to say what if. Friends, that's all I'm asking. Are you willing to say what if? I'm not interested in telling anybody how wrong they are anymore. I'm not, that did no good. Without an option of what we are to do, it doesn't matter exposing what we're doing wrong. I'm saying there's something for us to do with remembering the feasts and the festivals of the Lord that I do not yet understand. That's the journey I'm on that I am moving towards. But I'm telling you, we cannot go to what has been forsaken until we abandon what we're clinging to now that is keeping us from returning. We've got to abandon what we're holding on to now that's established in the traditions of natural men and say in our heart we're willing to be a set-apart foolish people because we are a consecrated people of God who should be identifiable, distinguishable, and marked. And we do so by carrying out His commands. That's how we love Him. That's how we honor Him. That's how we bring glory to His name. So friends, let's do that. Man, I'm just going to tell you, and I mean this with everything I have, if you have made it this far, thank you. I believe this is right. Not flawless, but overall, it is right. And I know few will listen. I know I don't understand it all myself. We are a flawed people journeying to be pleasing in the sight of the Lord. So friend, please be willing to walk away and abandon every single thing in your life that you value and cherish in order for that exchange to take place. We must live a life of exchange. And I'm telling you, the traditions of men, whether religious or just man-made celebratory living, is a wall between God and men. It's a wall between God and men. But it can come down. It can come down and the scales can fall from our eyes. I'm a living example of that. I'm not lacking anything. Now in my natural man, I want my son to have a Christmas morning. But friends, the exchange is invaluable and beautiful and worth every last tear and pain in my heart. Because I am willing to make the exchange. I am willing to lay down this natural temporal satisfaction for something eternal. My perspective, friends, is set. My perspective is set on pleasing Yahweh God. I'm sure of that today. Today now, I'm sure of that. I pray that your heart's condition. I pray that's your heart's condition. As we are confronting Christmas, the spiritual man perspective, we must have eyes of the Spirit. He is our only hope to see as God sees. Amen.